Senator Long, if you will. Uh, take the witness chair and give us the benefit of your many years of experience and your observations on. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, remember I speak off the cuff here today because I haven't had time to give this statement to the. editing and the uh, attention it deserves. I'd like to, I'll have more to say about it later on, but I do want to just say that in my view to put the Senate on television will prove to be a very bad mistake. Uh, the greatest surplus commodity we have in the Congress uh, are speeches that need never have been made. Uh, speeches that fail to improve on silence. Uh, when my father was a United States Senator about 35, well, 45 years ago, uh, the Senate met about six months out of the year. Now it meets 12 months out of the year and still doesn't get the nation's interest done. And a great deal of that has to do with the fact that uh, we just have a lot more conversation out there on the Senate floor than necessary. As a manager of bills, as a part of the leadership on occasion, I've tried to use my best efforts to try to keep people from talking so much, try to get them to uh, stop talking long enough to permit us to vote on something. And that's a very frustrating thing to try to do. Uh, now, when we put television in here where people have the potential of talking to 20 million Americans and hoping that many will tune in, or even a million, uh, every senator is a prima donna in one degree or the other. Uh, and every one of them is going, is going to be tempted to make himself a speech, appear for the benefit of the folks back home. And even those today who really only demand on taking the floor of the Senate uh, when they find it necessary uh, by the most conservative rule will find that they'll be required uh, to make that appearance in front of the cameras. Folks will ask, why don't we see more of our senator? Why doesn't he appear? So he'll have to be up there uh, making himself a presentation for the folks back home. And for those who are inclined to take an interest in being president of the United States, hoping lightning might strike them someday, what better opportunity than to uh, appear just as often as possible, say something that they think uh, would uh, have some appeal to people across the country. No doubt about it, it will call us to be in session a great deal of additional hours. Now, of course, if we're going to do it, uh, I'm sure that the people won't see a, the same kind of presentation the networks would like to give it, uh, th that such as they do at those national conventions. They won't show all those empty seats there. Uh, they'll see one person appear in front of the camera, and uh, he'll uh, make his speech, uh, it's more or less the way the House does it. And uh, for all one would know, he would have a full gallery uh, there to hear him. Uh, I can just recall how some of it was back when uh, one of our former colleagues was a member uh, who would take the floor on a Friday afternoon, address himself to his constituents out on the West Coast. Uh, the dead, of course, the, the date line for the press out there was about three hours later than it was in uh, Washington, D.C. And on occasion, I'd be the one who'd volunteer for the Democratic side of the aisle to be there and hear the speech. Someone had to be there to keep the Senate in session and act as the presiding officer. And uh, that presentation would go on hour after hour after hour. Now that, of course, that cost the Senate about $8,500 an hour for the Senate to stay in session during that time. Uh, nothing he was saying could, if he wanted to bother just to dictate all that to a secretary and put that in the record, that none of that uh, information that couldn't have been sent on out there uh, without the Senate paying $10,000 an hour for it, but uh, it gave the Senator an, an opportunity to project the image that he was there speaking to the nation and reporting to the entire nation. Uh, even if, if, if the word did get out he had sports attendance by way of the congressional record and he was there representing his people. Uh, now, think where, where we'd be if we had 100 Senators doing that same kind of thing. Uh, the 
We had just one little example of it when we were voting on the Panama Canal Treaty. That was not to be presented on television, but the people were to be uh, told how each senator voted when they called the roll. What did they do? They supposed to vote at a given hour. Well, then, here, then our leadership and a certain few senators said, oh, no, well, just a minute, if, if I'm going to be going to agree to this limitation, uh, then uh, you'll have to give me some additional time. Well, the way it worked out, the whole nation tunes in to see how the history is going to go on the Panama Canal Treaty, but do, we, do they hear us vote? Oh, no. Uh, they hear that Senator so-and-so has the floor, and after him, Senator so-and-so had the floor making a final speech. And every one of us know at that point, every man had made up his mind, every woman had made up her mind. No, mind. no votes were going to be changed, but even so, we couldn't vote. Even though we'd agreed in advance, we're going to vote long in advance. Uh, and the nation had been so alerted because we had to hear more speeches, uh, which were not going to change any votes. But in, in these type situations, we'll have the same type thing that goes on at the United Nations right now. Uh, I was one, there's a session some, several years, well, about 10 years ago. Every delegate has to make himself a speech at the opening session about what's going on in the whole wide world and how his nation views it. And it goes on for hour after hour after hour. And what we do for this delegation is to, uh, for our dele the U.S. delegation would have somebody sit there and uh, represent the whole delegation just to hold the fort to, as a courtesy to the other nations as though there was somebody from America there to hear this speech that this fellow made or represent our country to sit there while this man would go through these long presentations. Now, that goes on for weeks. Every nation explain what they think about matters. All of which, again, would be a better service to the country if they'd put all that stuff in the record. So anybody who wants to read it could read about it, and I'm sure that they'd find somebody to read it. But to keep that uh, General Assembly in, in session all that time uh, really serves no good purpose. Now, some can talk about uh, uh, the experience in the House. There's a difference. The House has a rules committee which tells, which parcels out the time and tells people how much time they have available to speak. But uh, if you're going to do this in the United States Senate, uh, you don't have any rule that limits debate. You have to get unanimous consent. And every senator would like to have himself presented to the folks by home who's in position, and the people all across the nation, a nationwide audience, he's in position to object, not willing to let you uh, uh, go forward and debate the matter and bring it to a vote or limit debate uh, unless you uh, uh, give him whatever time he insists on. And I've been engaged in many of those negotiations down through the years, and I know that in the last analysis, if he insists that he's got to have 10 hours, you're going to have to let him have the 10 hours in order to get that unanimous consent uh, to, uh, to limit debate. You have to, in the end, the leadership will have to uh, allow the senator whatever time that senator insists on having. Uh, it it's, will be an, uh, a, and may I say today, everybody knows uh, what happens in the Senate. You have the press in there, you have the reporters, uh, the media can all report on it, and every time somebody says something, if he makes a good speech, and they think it's worthy of note, they can invite him to come out and uh, appear before the TV cameras. And summarize in brief what he said before the, uh, the Senate to explain his views on the matter. Uh, now, if you put it on television, uh, as far as 99% of the people in the country, they aren't going to look at the space satellite uh, with one of these disks or something to see this thing go on all day long. Uh, what do they do? They'll uh, tune in on a news program, and the anchor man uh, will say, Here's what Senator so and so said, and he will tell you what his version of what the fellow said, and you'll see the man on television for about 30 seconds or maybe 10, uh, making an appearance, here's what he thinks about this and that. Uh, so the same thing could be achieved without impeding the work of the, of the legislating for the people of the country. You know, the Senate, the people did not elect the Senate. They don't send us here to wage a campaign for our reelection. Uh, or wage a campaign for election to some other office. They elect us here and send us to legislate and pass laws that are in their interest. While we're meeting up on the second floor of the Capitol building down in, this, in, the, in the basement, there's a 
TV press gallery, that, that probably there's a, a Senate recording studio that's in almost constant operation down there where senators are making presentations, uh, making speeches, arranging interviews, presenting their views uh, make it for the benefit of the people around the country and the folks back home. Uh, it would be a fantastic waste of the Senate's time and the public's time to move all that stuff upstairs and do it for free when down below a senator can do it, but he doesn't have to impede the work of the Senate. Uh, those, in brief, those are the reasons why I think that uh, this matter should not be put on television. I think that, uh, that people can have all the information they want and uh, we can do a great deal more legislating uh, without neglecting the nation's interest the way I believe it will be done uh, if we insist on putting the Senate on television. Thank you very much, Senator. What, what year did you come to the Senate? 1948. Last day. So that you've been here more than three decades. I've been here more than 30 years. Of course, your distinguished father was here for many years before that, and I assume that you he had a- He served many years. He uh, was a uh, rather impressive person, and uh, uh, he was here for less than one full term, but he, he made his mark while he was here made his mark on American history. But your, so your familiarity with the Senate and its procedures goes back really 40 years uh, through his. Uh, I was an observer of the Senate uh, at that point. I was about 16 years of age. Well, I was struck by your statement that uh, one of the reasons that the Senate sessions have grown so long is because the members make speeches that don't improve on silence. That's right. <laughs> and Senator, if we are asking one another, everybody knows that that's a, that's a very surplus commodity around here. I'd, I'd like to just sort of probe that with you a little bit. Now, when your father was here, There wasn't any environmental legislation. If anybody had talked about environmental legislation, I su suspect that, uh, that Huey Long would have thought they were talking at most about bird watching or something of that sort. Isn't that true? Well, I think he'd have gotten involved in it. Uh, he, was, he had a way of getting involved but, in but everything there wasn't, else. But there wasn't any in those days. That's right. And yet, to, and yet today it's proven to be a very time-consuming and, and uh, additional kind of issue that's before the Congress. Energy legislation, well, maybe in Louisiana, 40 years ago, oil was a subject of some, of some legislative uh, importance. But as far as the Congress was concerned, there wasn't much legislation in, very, the, very little. in the energy field. And we had very, very little, may I say, Mr. Chairman, uh, at the time that I came here, yeah. 30 years ago. So that's a whole new issue that's really grown up. And then, of course, your father's very tragic death occurred before, let's see, that was in, what year was that? 1935. 35, that's what I thought. So that was before World War II, and of course the, the issues of world leadership that have devolved upon the Congress as a result of World War II, all have contributed other issues. So what I'm, what I'm just suggesting is that the, the work of the Congress has really substantively grown in the span of your father's service and your own service here, and that perhaps the length of the sessions may reflect a, a, a verbose uh, uh, propensity on the part of members. And I'm sure we've all sat over there on the floor and say, why in the dickens doesn't that fellow shut up? <laughs> but, but it is true that also the, the work has expanded and that that's, yes. that's part of it. And, 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 and one thing that has increased it too is this very emphasis on this uh, so-called openness. There are things where that people want to say to one another that for fear of, of being misunderstood, uh, that they don't want to say until they've had a chance to uh, 
feel out other people, see what they think about matters. And so where we thought that we were going to have a, a, a presentation uh, of the, the exchange of ideas that caused people to firm up on their position. Uh, even now, people are, are timid about doing that until they've had a chance to discuss it with others. And those discussions with others, they still occur out of the presence of the media. Uh, they, they meet in party caucuses, which everybody's familiar with, and they, uh, uh, or they'll a group meet here and a group meet there. They still get somebody up on the side and talk to them and explore the other person's point of view uh, and explain theirs, what they think about it, uh, while they're making up their minds what their position is going to be on matters. Well, now that leads me to another question. Is, is there a possibility, and this is really a question that relates to human nature as much as to the procedures of the Senate, but is there a possibility that the presence of the media would actually be a restraining influence in the Senate chamber? That, that perhaps uh, I may be willing to stand up and uh, make myself look, look foolish to, to the two or three people who are wandering around the floor and not really listening very much at that. But if, if I know that there's a possibility that 20 or 30 million people may ultimately see and hear, that I'm going to be a lot more careful and a lot more restrained in what I say. So there's not the slightest doubt about it. Uh, the way it stands today, that's assumed that, uh, that, that you're not a member of the committee that reported that bill, but you have some thoughts about the subject. And uh, you walk on the Senate floor and hear the debate going on, and, and you participate. Now, you're, you're engaging in an exchange of ideas that the Constitution intended. But in the course of it, you make a statement that's somewhat in error. Well, the way it is now, uh, you're, you're permitted to correct in that record uh, where the reporter didn't get it right, and, 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 and that sort of gains with it a little editorial license to make a slight modification to not, make it reasonable. Not only where the reporter didn't get it right, but where you didn't get That's it right. That's right. And uh, you've had it, if you hadn't had it to happen to you, you will. Uh, 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 at some point, someone comes and says, look, you know, when I, in t when I, I took issue with you. What I said was this, and I really didn't mean that. I found out it was in there, but you objected. We just changed that a little bit to read this way, and people do it all the time. If the, if the other person is willing to, uh, to, let, to let the record be edited uh, to, to make some modification. So a person is not as vulnerable if he makes a misstatement. Uh, he has, sure the press hears him. If they want to report it, that, uh, that, that what he said was this, and they and him, the record reads this, well, they have a right to do it. But he is not as vulnerable to, for an honest mistake as he would be otherwise. And the result is that, that, uh, that people are going to be extremely cautious for fear that someone just lifts that one little thing up there where this fellow gets up and he says something where he has not the slightest well, the way they presented it is that he didn't have the slightest knowledge of what he's talking about. Now, the time they catch you two or three times like that, you're in bad trouble uh, with the folks back home if they present that on you. So, you, so the best thing is to keep your mouth shut uh, up until uh, you're positive that you're on the safe side. What you say uh, would be approved by the people on television. Now, now that's, that raises the point again. Once you put this thing on nationwide television, what audience is that senator going to be speaking to? Those senators? Or is he going to be speaking to the audience out there in, in the hinterland, the folks that might vote for him for, for re-election, or the folks that might vote for him for a higher office even than this? So that uh, he has to be very careful. And what he presents is going to be the stage thing. Uh, he's not going to take the chance on saying very much that, uh, that, that might be uh, poorly uh, received back home or by the people across the country when they see it on television. Uh, my uncle Earl was rather famous for saying things that other politicians wouldn't say, and we laugh about it around this chamber about some of my uncle Earl's stories. But he's one of the few people who could say something like that and survive. But he was saying things oftentimes that people in, were, were really thinking in the main. They just didn't dare say it. And incidentally, he didn't have any 100% election record like some of these people had. He had about a 500% batting average. He'd have to go out for a while and come back after people thought about it. And, I thought he wasn't such a bad guy after all. Actually, they meditated over some of the things he said uh, and some of the positions that he took and saw that there was uh, more merit to it uh, than they'd realized in the first instance. But, but, but that honest, free exchange event of views that, uh, that we've known in the Senate 
to a greater degree than any other body, will be very restrained when you put this thing on television. Senator, you and I know of things that happened just in the brief time that we've had here, and I needn't to tell you precisely the kind of thing I have in mind, but you know it as well as I do. When we put television in here on what the, the media thinks it should be, a free and unlimited basis, so pick up a senator, and for some reason you just don't look his best. Now, the good Lord only knows why the man didn't look his best, uh, but, uh, but they show that and let the public draw their own conclusion, and the, and the conclusion is adverse, very bad. Uh, so that uh, if you're going to have it without any limitation, that's the kind of thing you're asking for. And just one last thing. And the point that you have made, and it's the same point that, uh, that Senator Warner made it, uh, several times yesterday, was that the primary duty of the Senate is to legislate, and that you don't think television will have a, a positive influence on that primary duty of legislation. I've always had a feeling that maybe we had a, a triple duty here to, to advocate, to educate, and to legislate. Uh, and certainly, uh, if education is part of our function, then television might be of some value in that part of the, of the triple duty of a, of a member of the Senate. That's, That's right. right. Senator. These things have their pluses and their minuses. They're not black and white. They're varying shades of gray. Now, let's just talk about this matter of speaking to a larger audience. I have, on occasion, been accused of filibustering, and, 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 and I'm sure that time when the charge was well taken. Uh, and so have a lot of other senators. Before you do that kind of thing, you ought to decide whether you're justified in consuming the time of the Senate by delaying action on something whether the end justifies the mean. Now, I'd be willing just to, to stipulate, for, for lack of proof of, of what's in a person's conscience, that any time a person has done that, he was doing it because he felt that, that he was justified in doing so. And I, I think every senator who stands up there and filibusters uh, feels that he is justified. It takes a height of a rhinoceros to do it anyway, but plenty of senators have the height of a rhinoceros. So that that, that, that when he does that, he is a, if, many times, I've done it myself, where, where we're appealing to a larger audience. We hope that when the word goes out to people across the country, uh, that they're going to write in and say, look, I think that guy's right. And, uh, and, 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 and it don't take much encouragement when you're in that situation to keep on speaking and to do it day after day after day, especially if you have a, a group of other senators who agree with you and they're willing to, to, to join forces with you and help. I can recall when the, I was one of those people engaged in a space satellite filibuster. We thought it was a bad bell. We thought it was a monopolistic type bell. And we kept picking up strength. And frankly, uh, every time we'd convert another senator, we felt, well, that would justify about another month of conversation to, on the theory that if we kept it up long enough, we'd win that fight. Now, uh, this type of thing, uh, is in, will be encouraged when a person can, can take, the, take to the air right there on the Senate floor and make his case. Uh, and those who feel like uh, joining him can make their case. Uh, how much time do we have to devote to, uh, to a, a determined and dedicated filibuster? How much encouragement do we want to give them? Just keep on talking uh, on the theory that, that, that they are persuading people around the country to see it their way and that they voice of the public will in due time persuade that United States Senate, even though the Senate is unwilling to be persuaded at that moment. Uh, if, if, if this is to be done, we'll need a whole new set of rules. And, and you can't assure me that you can pass the rules that, uh, uh, that we'd be needing uh, to enable the Senate to move effectively, efficiently, uh, and realizing that it's far too inefficient the way it is right now. Oh, one other point I want to make. 
as far as 99% of the people that are concerned, what is said out there and what goes out on television will be on some, might be on the space satellite and somebody can get some of these, some of these spheres and pick it up. Uh, it might be on public education and, uh, and some people may look at it. But more than 90% of those who view it will be something that the networks pick up and list out of context and present with the anchor man explaining his view of it. Now, that will multiply about 10 and maybe 100 fold things that you know happen, and I know they do too. That is the manipulation of people. Oftentimes it's difficult to figure just whether that is a member of Congress manipulating the media or a member of the media manipulating a member of Congress. But they manipulate one another, one way or the other. Uh, and and some of the things have done that way uh, uh, really are, are downright shameful. And I'm saying shameful for a member of Congress. I'm not pointing the finger scorn at the media in this regard. Uh, I've known how some members in, in years gone by have uh, uh, to get ho hopeful of getting some favorable treatment uh, by certain reporters. Uh, have just leaked all kind of uh, national secrets to those reporters that uh, shouldn't uh, it shouldn't be leaked, but they're expecting to get some, uh, some favorable publicity out of those people. When you look on television, you see certain uh, reporters, uh, some of them famous for it, reading from all these secret documents. Where do you think they're getting all that? Now, it, it's from people in government who should not be leaking that information. Now, uh, but many, it, but when a member of Congress, uh, go out and find ways to get himself uh, on, the, on the air around the country. He's still not getting through to his constituents. So what does he do then? He then proceeds to approach the fellow who owns a television station or the uh, guy who runs a television station or the, the little, little lady who's the anchor person on the news program and to see that, to try to ingratiate himself with those people to, so that those people will present him. And even if what he said is of, of scant interest to the national audience, back home, uh, they'd be justified in putting him on television even though they didn't have, a, have, it other, have him otherwise. So even though in 99 and 9 tenths percent of the cases, what he says is left on the cutting room floor when they put together their, their news program, notwithstanding that, he's made himself a friend back in his hometown. And that person lifts it out and puts in, here's our senator out there fighting for the people. And I can just see this fellow. Here he is. Everybody's gone home. Uh, whoever the poor soul is left there to hold the majority leader's desk, or the, the, the minority leader's desk, is pleading with him, begging him, pleading with him, won't you please wind up your speech and put the rest of this thing in the record so we can go and get some rest this night and get on with our business. Oh, no, he, his administrative assistant is writing a note saying, keep going. This just will look great back in Podunk. And so, so that uh, he, no mercy will we get. Uh, it, it's, in situations like that, uh, you have held a leadership chair for the leader on occasion, I'm sure, just as I have. And on a situation like that, you can turn your back to the man. You can just pretend that you don't hear a word he said is uh, being arrested and other matters, uh, checking to the desk drawer to see what, what, what might have been left down there that should have been taken to the office one thing or another. Notwithstanding that, that not a soul listening to him. He's speaking on nationwide television. And to get this fellow to, to subsist is, is, I think, more than, the, than, than any of us can hope to achieve. Uh, you have to keep in mind the human nature aspects of it. And, uh, and, and I honestly do believe, Senators, that, uh, we're, that, that we're not going to get the nation's business done, certainly not one half as efficient as we're doing it now. And right now, we're not half as efficient as we ought to be. Senator Ford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Long, you're the first witness we've had that's been in uh, opposition to the televising. Um, most of the witnesses we had yesterday all were uh, very much in favor of uh, opening up the Senate uh, chamber to the television cameras. And one of the threads that ran through each of those uh, statements yesterday would raise the Senate to its rightful place. Now, do you have any comment as it relates to that uh, particular statement that television in the Senate chamber would raise it to its rightful place? Well, mm. time, let's just look at all these so-called reforms that we've voted in recent years. Uh, 
Can anybody say that, uh, that, that that's raised the stature of the Senate uh, any more than it did before? We, we passed a whole lot of rules by way of ethics. Uh, I, I don't see the public thinks we didn't want anything we did before we passed all these rules. Uh, and uh, uh, I know that it will not elevate the caliber of debate in the United States Senate. Uh, we won't be speaking to the, I'll, I'll put it this way, to a much lesser degree will we be speaking to the people we're supposed to convince. We're supposed to be here to convince other senators that they should vote for this bill. We're not really supposed, it's not our primary function to try to convince the folks back home that they ought to reelect us. And more and more, that, this thing of addressing yourself to the larger audience on television will tend to be the, the, the approach rather than addressing yourself to the people you have. That, you know, many times when we have a bill before us, we'd be addressing ourselves to a, a very informed audience who have been thinking about this problem for years and studying it already. But uh, when you take on the television to do it, you've got to think in terms of the lowest common denominator and try to address yourself to uh, the level of understanding that people across the country have. Senator, uh, we uh, got far beyond the uh, question of uh, cameras in the Senate chamber yesterday. When I say we got far beyond that, we're talking about change in rules, uh, the consent agreements, uh, unanimous consent, uh, whatever. And that uh, the present majority leader proposed yesterday, and he looked at Doc Riddick here and said, I say we ought to start from scratch and remove all of our rules and start all over again. So we've gone much further than uh, just uh, TV cameras in the chamber. We're already talking about changing everything, and some statements were made here yesterday, 205 years has served us pretty well under our present procedure. But uh, can you see the uh, possibility of major changes in the rules of, of the Senate? Well. Probably the best rule we have in the United States Senate, as of now, is a rule that protects the right of a single senator to take that floor and hold it for a while when he thinks everybody else is wrong. Uh, one of the best examples of that was uh, when Harry Truman, in good faith, thought that the answer to the railroad strike was to draft the railroad workers into the union. Another example was when Franklin D. Roosevelt thought that we ought to pack the Supreme Court uh, to, to overcome what he thought was some unwise decisions. Uh, when those bills first came to the Senate, they would have passed, but uh, th they simply couldn't stand the, the, the thoughtful speeches that were made against them by, by senators who saw that there was a great deal more to it than the President of the United States saw at that point. And in, in due course, I think we can all pretty well agree that what those people were advocating at that point was a mistake. But the free debate in the Senate will have to go if the television comes in, because there'll be such a, an overwhelming desire of senators to present themselves to, to the nationwide audience, uh, knowing that, it, that, that, that they will, will have complete recognition by all, that, that, that the free debate, the power of a single person to hold something up until he can persuade others that he is right will have to go. We have an old saying in the Senate, uh, and it, and it came from the days when we had only male members. Uh, one man on God, one man on the side of God is a majority, uh, which was basically that well, one a single senator was justified in filibustering. Uh, if he was convinced he was right, and what he was doing was in, in the interest of these people of this country. But, uh, and many times a person has started out all by himself and wound up with a majority on his side. I know on occasion uh, uh, when I was on, felt, had the feeling I was in the minority, I'd been accused of being a filibustering when what we were doing was just debating this thing long enough to persuade some people that, that, uh, that, that we were, were right. And, and once we had persuaded a majority, then it was the other fellow's turn to filibuster and then see what he could do. So that, uh, uh, that the free debate of the United States Senate is the most valuable asset we have. And television will kill it for a simple reason. Television will make such a complete demand for unnecessary speeches for the benefit of their constituency back home that uh, 
that, that, that you just won't have the free debate anymore. Uh, you will not be permitted to leave it to the conscience of an individual senator how much time he ought to consume presenting his argument before the, the Senate. We uh, heard a statement yesterday, and uh, we're going to get it. Well, let me just say this. It's going to be very difficult to change the rules of the Senate. We have to get two-thirds before you can change the rule. If I, memory serves me right of the lessons I learned when I first arrived by some of the sages here. And uh, so that uh, indicates it may be a little while before we change any rules in the Senate. A statement was made yesterday, we must... Incidentally, Senator, to that, and that also may lead to a charge that we're filibustering the moment some of us start debating this matter, uh, if it's reported out. Because uh, you and I know, as long as we insist on debating the issue on the motion to proceed, the opposition has to have two-thirds in order to pass that bill. Uh, once we let them get past that point, they only need 60 votes in order to gag us. So that uh, uh, it's the, the logical point to start debating if you think that this is something that could be of grave injury to the nation and to the nation's future. Uh, and you th honestly think what you're doing is, is to try to preserve the best that is in the United States. And I still think, in spite of all our defects, this is the greatest deliberative body on earth. There's more freedom here and more chance to defend freedom here than there is any place on God's green earth. We were told uh, yesterday, Senator, that we must master TV. And by a very intelligent uh, witness, uh, had a great uh, deal of credibility. It was also some thought that if we master TV and we're worried more about TV, that we're putting the medium ahead of the message. And uh, that uh, concerned some of us. Let me ask you this. You indicated, and Senator Warner did yesterday, uh, fear of making mistakes. Uh, Senator Dole even quipped, can we have an uh, instant replay uh, for video instead of correcting the record? Uh, you made national television with that quip last night, <laughs> Senator. <and I. laughs> uh, but uh, while the fear of honest mistakes in front of cameras will uh, restrain uh, participation in debate, isn't it also likely that the uh, presence of cameras will greatly encourage the general, superficial, carefully prepared speeches which add nothing uh, uh, above silence uh, come into being more so than we've seen in the past? Senator, it will encourage those kind of speeches in extent so. Here's something that's already been said. It's been said 10 times over. Suppose you're in the Panama Canal debate. The best line you can say is, this is a giveaway. All right, now, uh, if you had that debate on television, uh, you would hear that line probably a, a thousand times. How many times do you have to hear it to know that the, the, the people who are on that side happen to think it's a giveaway? But that's one of their best punchlines. And uh, so it goes. Uh, well, of course you're right about that. There's been some suggestion, I said yesterday, that we're, we'd go from here, from the House to the Senate and then to the President's Cabinet meeting and so forth. And it may be to the point where uh, you say now it's time for the public to vote, and they push their button, and there's 46 percent yes and 42 percent no, and we'd be expected to vote by that computer press in at home by watching the debate. <laughs> Some ideas about that and uh, the independent judgment or the debate uh, uh, that we talk about. A lot of problems. I think we could be uh, uh, facetious about some of them, uh, but uh, the greatest deliberative body here needs to have a great deal of scrutiny. We also want to run into one other thing, and this is my last one, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for taking so long. But we just saved almost $5 million and made some of our colleagues uh, squirm just a little bit by reducing their amount of money on their committees. And you were here and testified, and I don't think you and Senator Dole were completely pleased with the amount of money that we took from your committee, but you accepted that. But now we're turning right around and getting ready to spend what we saved and more to, to inject uh, cameras into the Senate chamber. And I'm just not sure that's going down uh, too well uh, without having it uh, taken a poll back home as it relates to the mood in which the public is as it relates to cutting back on expenditures of federal government. Well, what, what you saved by bearing down on the Finance Committee would, will finance about one hour of, the, of, of additional speeches that would be made uh, to the tune of Goodness knows how much. Uh, I guess the tune of about a thousand, at least a thousand hours a year. 
Not to mention the, uh, the time that those speeches consume and the degree to which they prevent you from voting on matters that uh, the Senate should vote on. More and more, the Senate will be required to pass the legislative decision on to the executive branch to make by way of regulation rather than by decision of the elected officials. So that uh, the, sa the saving, in my judgment, will be, uh, well, the, the, the cost, I think, would, would, would be very, very large. But, but the big cost is one that, that is missed, and that is the cost of passing the decision on to someone who has never been elected by anybody uh, to make law by way of regulation, which, as you know, is just binding on you in many instances. In fact, you're just the same as if it had been an act of Congress. Well, I took a little literary license in that, but the story is that I asked Uncle Earl, the, the, the question was, should ideals be used in politics? And Uncle Earl said, well, which side are you on? I said, well, I'm on the affirmative. He said, well, that's good. He said, I think you've got the best side. What you ought to tell those people is, well, heck yes, use ideals. Use anything you can get your hands on. <laughs> but, but these people, when they have an opportunity to, uh, to appear, <laughs> That will be one more thing they can get their hands on. That'll get them, hopefully, get a few votes. And, uh, and I, I honestly don't think it's going to elevate the caliber debate. I don't think that we're going to learn as much as we would have learned because we're going to hear more repetitious debate that way. And there'll be less of an inclination of a person saying something that should be said for, for fear he might be misunderstood by somebody out there across this nation than there would be before. And, I, and uh, all that to me adds up to the fact that, uh, that if we want to involve ourselves in this at all, the way to do it would be to do it uh, on an experimental basis, and that, and that can be done by unanimous consent. I know nobody would object. Where we have some high point, something we think is a high point of interest, uh, to, all right, say, let's, let's give it a try. Let's, let them bring the cameras in and show this. Uh, if you put it on, People will try to be presenting themselves at their best, and when we think that we have something that's worth presenting, uh, where uh, we'd like for the public to see it, and at a time when we know we're going to attract a crowd, uh, because we'll attract some interest at that point. We'll have a pretty good show to present to them, and one that will pique their interest. At that point, I think it might be, that, that it might be very worth considering to bring TV cameras in, let them uh, present the closing arguments for the two sides. But uh, to put this thing on television, gavel to gavel, I think would be a, a, a disaster. Thank you very much, Senator Long. Our next witness as scheduled is Representative Rose. I don't believe he has yet arrived. So we'll go on to the next uh, panel, which is the Congressional Research Service Panel. Mr. Bach, Mr. Stanley Bach, and Mr. Roger David. <laughs> Gentlemen, I see that, that Representative Rose has just arrived. Perhaps we should re revert to the regular order. Uh, <laughs> So, Representative Rose, if you'd take the witness. I apologize for being late, but I couldn't get over when you were Well, that's about a hairbreadth, as a hairbreadth, uh, an arrival as I've ever seen. Your, your were you complaining about the elevators? No, it had senators only up at the top of it, and I had to walk down to the end of the hall. <laughs> You know, it's, I'm always impressed by Congressman, uh, Mr. Chairman, they can read. <laughs> <laughs> it's a prerequisite to running for the Senate. <laughs> Representative Rose, uh, you have uh, a major responsibility for the operation of the television system in the House of Representatives. And I think that this committee would benefit by 
hearing your views on just how it works and uh, what uh, benefits you think have flowed from it and what problems have arisen. Senator uh, Mathias and Senator Ford, Senator Warner, I appreciate being invited to come and, and tell you about our experience in the House. Uh, I'll go back to the time when Jack Brooks was given by the Speaker of the House permission to, to install some black and white cameras on our, uh, in our hall to see if a closed circuit system would not be possible. From that day until about two years ago, uh, we experimented with a, a very rudimentary system to see how it would, would work in the House. We connected it with our House cable system and let all the members look at this in their, in their particular office. That's as far as it went. And then we found out that the cable television industry was very much interested in, in whatever the signal was that we put out because they were going to put it up on a satellite and give it to cable television systems all across the country. And so we quickly realized that, that whatever system we put into operation, that it was going to be, the signal was going to be used and it was going to reflect on the house uh, uh, by its appearances so that we should, if we were going to do this, we should do a quality job. The speaker asked me to be chairman of the committee that was responsible for putting it together. Jack Brooks and Gillis Long and uh, Dave Stockman. The four of us together w w ultimately worked out the, the procedure. One of the big problems th that we were concerned about was, uh, was, li was lighting. There was some concern that the lights would be so bright that uh, and a long session in the House, especially late at night, that it would just be very tiring for members. And there's a technical point to be made here. And, and two things that you all need to be aware of. In Canada, as in the United States Senate, members speak from their seats. In the House, members speak from one or two or three assigned areas. We were able, with the help of uh, Mr. Ferentino and associates in New York, who is a lighting expert, who've had great experience in lighting the Metropolitan Opera and other, other theatrical institutions. <laughs> uh, no pun intended. Um, to come down and... Yeah, all right. He came down and showed us how we could direct the lighting in the house to cover just two or three of the, to, to cover the areas where members spoke. The foot candles would be adequate, adequately bright there, but not so bright elsewhere. That turned out to be the, the perfect solution. Now, we also uh, were concerned about who operated the cameras. Uh, the, the members and had expressed great interest to the, to the leadership that our cameras be operated by House employees who were instructed to follow the action of the floor, the, the same thing that would go in the congressional record. The person who was at that time speaking or who was in the chair or who was seeking recognition. There would therefore be no opportunity for, for cutaways or for uh, reaction shots. <clears throat> and, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, not presume to tell you how you should make that decision, but the power to make reaction shots, the, the editorial ability to make those reaction shots or those cutaway shots is the, is the ability to editorialize about what is going on at that particular point in time. So we decided that our employees would be instructed simply to follow the action of the floor. And that brings with it another benefit that, that we found important in the House. Uh, we could use lower light levels by just concentrating on those places where people were speaking. 
the normal industry, television industry, likes to have lights that are brighter because focusing of the cameras is less precise in bright lights than it is in dim lights. Senator Baker, being a photographer, can explain about depth of field to you. But that has something to do with the level of comfort that the senators will experience. So there's some trade-offs that you're going to have to decide about. Who's going to run the cameras? How bright are you going to make the lights? Are the brightnesses going to be for the benefit of the networks if they run the cameras? Or are they going to be for the benefit of the senators? I would urge you, uh, the architect of the Capitol was a m masterful partner for us in all of these deliberations. And he and his people have been through all of this, and they know very well how that fit together. Uh, I, would, uh, I would urge you to get an expert that knows about lighting, maybe several, and get them to to, to give you that kind of advice. I would send people to Canada. I'm sure you've already done that. Some of you gentlemen should go to Canada and see the Canadian system and see their, their, uh, their operation. Somebody said to us when we started, uh, won't the House members play to the gallery? Well, we went back and found in the congressional record of many years ago where when the Senate decided to admit the press and the public the concern was expressed over a hundred years ago that, that senators would, would play to the gallery. Well, that hasn't occurred. It hasn't seriously, you know, whatever occurred has, has been, in my opinion, for the benefit, not the detriment of our, our democracy. And I have found that my constituents in my district who do have access to the House floor proceedings over television, and clearly, if you are televised, cable television industry will carry you, and so will the networks, will carry you all across the country. Uh, it gives you an electronic window to the country, and it gives the country an electronic window on the Senate and the House that I think is very good for our system. So I have talked with the parliamentarian of our body on numerous occasions, a man who watches with great interest the fine changes that occur in our process and our procedure. And he is satisfied with, with what has happened to the House in the two years that we've had television cameras. We have had almost no special speeches to the camera. Some members may comb their hair a little better than they did before. Some may dress a little more thoughtfully than they did before. Uh, somebody asked uh, Jack Brooks one time, they said, well, why don't you pan the crowd, uh, the, 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 the gallery? And Jack says, some of our brothers think better with their eyes closed, and we wouldn't want that to be misinterpreted. Uh, that, of course, has not been a, any problem. We do not show anything except the people who are speaking. But we have six cameras, and, and you, can, you can make the, the show look, the, the floor look very good with the, with the change in those angles. You can, you can make it look interesting and give a sense of, of, of exactly what's happening on the floor by changing those camera angles. So I, I, I offer any support you need to, to your staff, Mr. Chairman, to, to talking with them personally about what we did in the House. Uh, RCA provided us exceptionally fine service in uh, uh, making available all the people that worked in Canada, all the people that worked in New York for their operation, and they would certainly do the same here. Uh, I think. Uh, I hate to see you get into television for only one selfish reason, and that's because you're going to eclipse us uh, when you do. But uh, I think it'll be good for the country, and I think you'll find that it will be very good and healthy for your institution. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Were there any rules changes required as a result of the use of television? The only rule that was adopted was that 
there would be no commercial or political uses allowed of this house floor signal. Now we take that signal and give it to anybody that wants to use it, that is with the news broadcast. But obviously once it goes out over a satellite into millions of homes with cable television systems, anybody at any of those homes could have the proper recording equipment and could make a recording of what they see. So our house rules, in point of fact, only apply to members of Congress. We don't have an arm that reaches out to say to political challengers, although we have told them that that our intention, and our intention certainly was, that no one, either members or challengers or anybody in the public, would use those signals for commercial or political purposes. We've had very little trouble with that. But those are the only rules changes. You haven't had to make any procedural changes in the House. I have not made any procedural changes that I'm aware of. If they were, they were so small I haven't noticed them. And are those the only restrictions on the use of the of the TV fa uh, feed and the and the uh, videotapes? Yes. Those are yes. Would it be a great uh, burden to you to give us a breakdown of the total cost of the house installation? I'll be happy to. If you I, would, if you would supply that for the record. I'll be glad to. Do you have in your mind a ballpark figure? Yes, sir. In, the, in my mind is the figure of about $1,250,000 that was spent for the equipment and the uh, necessary uh, cabling and technical equipment. Now then the architects, people, and their time and expense in putting all that stuff into place would have to be figured in. But well, if, if you can give us the total, I, I think that would be helpful. Do you know? Well, that was the next question that I was going to ask. What it, what it's costing you to operate and maintain it? Um, annually, we are we are talking about the salaries of of uh, ten to twelve employees of the house clerk, and I would be happy to supply that for you for the record. It is very very reasonable. It is in the neighborhood of two hundred thousand dollars a year. Well, now one final question. Do you think it has encouraged a verbosity in the House? Um, no, because television, most members, and I'm sure senators as well, realize that television is a very cool medium. Even cruel. Yeah. Cool and cruel. And if you have very little to say and put a lot of wind behind it, television picks that up far quicker than sometimes does the printed page. That is good. And, and, and therefore, I find members more precise and more cautious, just as we are all very cautious when we are uh, in an interview at uh, our local television stations. Members tend to be more precise, and, and, and I think we're getting better speeches, Senator. <laughs> but are they too cautious? That's the other side of it. I don't right? think so. Because sometimes, as Senator Long just testified, it is valuable to speculate uh, aloud uh, to uh, say, well, on the one hand and well, on the other hand, and then through the chemistry of debate and the chemistry of uh, discussion and the interaction of, of human beings, you come up with, with a decision. How it does does uh, television inhibit that chemical process? I don't think so, because after about three months, m members, uh, maybe they didn't forget it subconsciously, but consciously they forgot the cameras were there. Our cameras are remote controlled. There are no operators standing in the gallery moving the cameras. The cameras are on little motorized pedestals that are controlled remotely from a room under the floor of, of the house. And that's the same system the Canadians use, and, and your people have total access to see anything they want with our, our system. So I, very few on either side of the aisle were inhibited. Uh, uh, but as I said earlier, did in my opinion become fairly precise about what it was they wanted to say. Senator Ford? 
Congressman, you gave an estimate of the cost about, I think, a million two hundred thousand for six cameras and uh, uh, allied equipment. Yes, that was just the equipment. Now, that wasn't re re retrofitting the room and. and well, there were other expenses. The other, that was just the technical cost of the. Well, you had some camera. additional cost then beyond the one point two million. That's right. The reason I asked that question, uh, we were advised yesterday that uh, it would be a minimum of six cameras for us and the optimum would be eight. And uh, our cost, I think, was somewhere around four million. Uh, that would be inclusive. And uh, as you said, the architect of the Capitol gave you masterful help. And uh, he was here yesterday and testified as to what, after his experience there and what we would have here and the difference in the uh, uh, arrangement of cameras in the and uh, our cost per year would run around 400,000 uh, personnel and uh, maintenance and so forth and you're telling us that your uh, personnel and maintenance is about 200,000 I'm telling you that the personnel alone and I'm, I'm just giving I'll supply you exactly yeah. for the record but we got about 12 people and I'm sure they are paid somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty thousand dollars a person and so that's where I got that horseback opinion. That does not include maintenance, Senator. And well, of and course, three years ago and today, the cost will be somewhat more. And you have a different lighting problem because you, you, you're not going to change Senate rules and require members to come to the well to speak. You're going to continue with this similar practice. And you raised that question almost immediately uh, in your presentation this morning, and Senator Warner has raised this, that we will be speaking from our desk and not from the well. And uh, there is some problem in some senators' minds as to the vacancy of the seats, uh, the appearance that a senator is not. Now, I know you've said that you can't draw any general conclusions from, from the world experience, but uh, on these two points, is there any, can you give us any guidance? I think the experience um, of other legislatures has been that um, inevitably there is some maneuvering among members and uh, factions and parties for um, debate time, particularly in prime hours if it's gavel to gavel coverage. But my guess would be that the overall impact of television would be in the direction of conciseness and compactness. Uh, certainly, this has been the experience of the, of the um, relationship of television to the national nominating conventions uh, that the political parties uh, hold. In 1924, they had 103 ballots at the Democratic National Convention. This would be unheard of today, uh, in part because uh, the parties have responded uh, to the demands for a more concise procedure. Now, there are arguments on both sides as to whether this has been useful. That you have primaries that, that, that tend to change the, the importance of the national nominating conventions. But I would suspect that, um, that uh, the experience has been, by and large, that television tends to encourage uh, brevity uh, and conciseness. If I could comment on that, Senator. Um, First, I think we need to distinguish between the short-term and long-term effects. If the cameras are operating daily in the House or Senate, I suspect whatever short-term effects there might be on senators and congressmen's behavior may change over time. Uh, second, I think the one discernible change in House activity that has followed televising House proceedings is the increase in the number of one-minute speeches made at the beginning of each day. They have the advantage of being terse, usually pointed, well-designed for evening news coverage, and also timely, both in the fact that they occur early in the day's proceedings and because they don't have to be directed toward the pending legislative business. One, if one were to extrapolate, therefore, one might expect to see some increase in the number of requests for special orders on the Senate floor. Perhaps briefer special orders, but nonetheless possibly an increase. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, one of the arguments that was traditionally made in favor of extended debate on the Senate floor 
was that it would permit opportunity for public opinion to be mobilized and for the public then in turn to contact their senators and to possibly change the votes that some senators had originally intended to cast. Well, if there is gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the Senate, I should think that argument would take on force because any matter that's going to divide the Senate intensely is going to be brought to the attention of the public immediately and very forcibly. And so it might be more practical then to assume that extending debate on the floor could in fact generate an inflow of constituency opinion. In other words, we can speculate and come up with plausible speculations that take us in totally contradictory directions. Mr. Chairman, two quick ones. Uh, you make a lot of assumptions, you know, and uh, I think that's maybe what you have to do from the experience that you've, but do you have any hard evidence as distinct from general assumptions uh, that indicate the television has been effective in improving the work of such bodies that you've uh, enumerated here this morning? I don't know how we go about even testing that claim. There's well, there's been a lot of claims, uh, you know, and so if you can't <laughs> test it, how in the world can you uh, come up here and make claims? You know, uh, I'm asking you, you're not making any claims. Yes. No. I'm afraid uh, there's nothing in the studies that have been done on this subject, either in this country or abroad, that would give us hard evidence to go on in terms of the specific legislative product. We do have instances of increased uh, public uh, awareness and understanding of the legislature, and in some cases, probably an increased uh, public uh, uh, approval of the legislature and its activities. But even those uh, pieces of evidence are so scattered that uh, I'm, um, I'm not confident that we know precisely uh, the effects of television. Senator, for what it's worth, about Three and a half years ago, I made a brief telephone survey of uh, legislative staff in state legislatures across the country. And I think that it's a fair generalization that when asked what effect television had had on their, their internal operations, the general reaction was not much. That after a while, things proceeded pretty much as they had before. And so really what we're talking about here is not much. Well, that was their impression several years well, ago. Well, you took a survey of it, and 49 of the 50 states have uh, television in the chambers. It may be public television, educational television, or whatever. And then it's uh, an hour and evening edited by so-and-so as what so-and-so said, and so you get an edited procedure then also. That's right, because we're talking about state experience, which by and large is not comparable to what the House now does and would not be comparable to the coverage envisioned in SRS 20. I would add one bit of evidence which is in my uh, prepared testimony and that comes oh, good. from a, uh, a, a study in Florida where they actually did interview uh, people from the media, legislators and the general public. Uh, there were positive impacts. Legislators reported the mail, increased uh, support and understanding from constituents and uh, media people re reported the same kind of thing. So that in, in, in that one instance, at least, uh, there was a positive uh, a value that was attributed to television. What changes in the standing rules of the Senate will either be necessary or desirable if we begin broadcasting uh, Senate proceedings? Uh, we got into a long range where we were going uh, in order to accommodate television on the Senate floor, we're going to change all our rules there's going to be an immediate impact as it relates to changing the rules. Well, Senator, I wouldn't presume to interject myself into that debate. I would note... <laughs> on television on the floor, so get into the rules. You've mentioned well, the rules yourself. I would, I would note that there are some significant differences between what happens on the House floor and the Senate floor. For example, most of those House speeches are quite brief. When the House is considering amendments, it's under a five-minute rule. Uh, another difference, which might be more important, is that House proceedings tend to be continuous and uninterrupted. Uh, I frankly don't know exactly how gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage in the Senate would cope with unexpected recesses for an hour or more, or the frequency of quorum calls 
when the number and duration of those quorum calls can't be anticipated. I think the chair. Just following that question, in France, they only cover major events, according to your statement. Now, who decides what's a major event? My understanding is that this is a matter of, of considerable negotiation, uh, primarily from the government of the day and the, and the major factions that make up that government. And there's, the there's, a good, there's a good and deal. The opposition and jointly and the opposition decision. jointly. And there's a good deal of uh, back and forth uh, negotiation on that. Thank you very much, gentlemen. A very helpful statement. Our final panel this morning is the commercial television panel which will be comprised of Mr. Carl Bernstein, representing the ABC Washington Bureau, Mr. Sid Davis, the NBC Washington Bureau, and Mr. Edward M. Foy, the representing or director of news of CBS. Gentlemen. Carl, this would be a splendid opportunity for you to tell us who Deep Throat is. Gentlemen, I'm grateful for the opportunity to testify before this distinguished committee on a matter of such importance to the public and the institution of the Senate itself. You have before you a decision that can be of enormous benefit to the Congress of the United States, to broadcast journalism, and most important, to the American people. Simply put, Senate Resolution 20 would bring the people of the United States and their senators closer together. Its adoption would ensure greater understanding of the legislative process, illuminate the great issues, and clarify the deliberations which affect the lives of all Americans. Its adoption would permit the American people to see and hear for themselves their elected representatives as they conduct those deliberations. For broadcast journalists, adoption of Senate Resolution 20 provides nothing less than the means to do our job, to present informed, informative, and fair news coverage, bringing to it the added dimension that only television and radio can provide. It was more than 20 years ago that a visionary U.S. Senator, Claude Pepper of Florida, now a member of the House, first suggested that the infant technology of television be used to broadcast hearings and floor debates. Since then, the U.S. Senate and the net networks have worked together extensively and successfully toward that end. Indeed, many of the most remarkable moments in our post-war history have been etched indelibly on the national consciousness as a result of that cooperation. During the Army McCarthy hearings, at the Kefauver investigations of organized crime, and the investigation of Watergate by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Recently, Senator Howard ba Baker, the ranking minority member of that committee and now majority leader of this great house, succinctly stated the need for televised coverage of proceedings in the Senate chamber. Such coverage, in my view, he stated, is simply a modern day extension of the public gallery and the public's right to view the legislative process of their government in a firsthand manner, end quote. We at ABC News could not agree more. How then should this coverage be provided? We believe it is essential that coverage be undertaken by professional journalists, not by Senate employees, in a manner that is consistent with the principles of a truly free press, a press unencumbered by even the suggestion of government control. By following such a course, we enhance the credibility of both your institution and ours. The report of this committee's staff and the experience of the House demonstrates persuasively that any technical problems of broadcasting from the Senate chamber can be overcome without violating the architectural integrity of the chamber or intruding unnecessarily upon floor activities. Since technical problems are not a consideration, we believe that we, as broadcast journalists, should be permitted the same unrestricted access as print journalists to produce our own coverage. Reporters, not those who make the news, should cover the news. Senate Resolution 20, sponsored by Senators Baker and Roth, calls on this committee to formulate basic television policy for the Senate. 
In addition to the essential element that journalists provide that coverage, we urge you to include the following points in that policy. The Senate should permit coverage of all floor proceedings, in no way limited or terminated, except by resolution of the Senate or invocation of the secret session rule. The Senate should control closed circuit distribution of the live signal to the congressional community and, for archival purposes, to the Library of Congress. Above all else, we believe the country's news organizations have a right and an obligation to report, without undue governmental restraint, the deliberations of our highest lawmaking bodies. The legislatures of 44 states now permit open broadcasting of their proceedings. Forty of those legislatures allow broadcasters themselves to handle the cameras and microphones. In sum, we fully support Senate Resolution 20. We urge the Senate and members of this committee to further embrace the concept of a free and independent press by entrusting us, professional journalists, with the responsibilities that go with providing full coverage of the floor deliberations of the United States Senate. I'd be happy to respond to your questions. All right, Mr. Davis. I'm Sid Davis, Vice President and Bureau Chief for NBC News in Washington, and I appreciate the opportunity to present the views of NBC News in favor of opening the floor proceedings of the Senate to television and radio. NBC News is pleased to support Senate Resolution 20, submitted by Senators Baker and Roth, which would provide for television and radio coverage of floor proceedings under terms and conditions prescribed by this committee. We believe that this resolution is sufficiently broad to permit appropriate coverage of Senate proceedings under whatever technical plan this committee recommends to your colleagues. In this regard, we at NBC News believe three principles should guide your selection of a coverage plan. First, we believe that whatever technical plan is adopted, there should be coverage of all areas of the Senate chamber. With the modern equipment available now, complete coverage can be accomplished with little or no disruption to the normal functioning of the Senate. Second, we believe the system should be operated by the media, most likely on a full basis, in order to minimize cost and any inconvenience to the members. Professional broadcasters have the experience and resources to produce a quality signal for the public and for you, the members. Once again, as with any news coverage, broadcasters should be able to cover all activities within range of their microphones and cameras. Third, any pooling arrangement should include all news organizations that desire to participate. And most importantly, the product of the coverage should be available to all news organizations under a fair and equitable plan. Obviously, some news organizations will use more material from the floor than others. But I would like to emphasize that each broadcast or cable network, television station, radio station, or cable system should have access to the live pool signal at a charge which represents its fair share of the common cost. As you know, Mr. Chairman, our cameras and microphones have for many years been admitted to Senate hearing rooms, and we've had the ability to report those proceedings to the American people with speed and clarity. NBC News believes that the time has come for the Senate to open its floor deliberations to electronic coverage. We stand ready to assist you and your staff, which has been extremely helpful in conducting preliminary tests in order to achieve the rapid implementation of the objectives of Senate Resolution 20. I want to thank you for listening and would be pleased to attempt to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Foy. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'll uh, dispense with the reading of my statement, uh, uh, except the one paragraph that I'd like to emphasize. Uh, with, I think you without have without objection, of it. your full statement will be included in the record. CBS strongly believes that broadcast coverage of Senate proceedings should no more be controlled by Senate employees than should print coverage. As long as broadcast coverage is unobtrusive, and it would be, there is no persuasive basis for such discrimination. Further, to the extent that journalists must rely on government handouts, whether in the form of press releases or television feeds from cameras controlled by government employees, the public interest in a free and robust press is not being fully served. It's short-sighted and unpersuasive to argue that coverage left to professional broadcast journalistic organizations might be somehow unfair so that the Senate staff had better operate those cameras and microphones. The credibility of any government institution, and for that matter the press, depends on public confidence. This confidence in the Senate would be furthered to the extent the increasingly sophisticated public perceives that Senate processes are being subject to reporting by professional journalists and are not just being publicized by Senate employees, however competent they may be. 
be pleased to try and respond to your questions. Thank you very much. And the committee is very grateful to all three of you for being willing to come here because what we are considering really is a, a new relationship with the very important industry that you all represent. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bornstein, the Library of Congress yesterday, I think used the term coming to terms with television. And I think that is in a sense uh, an accurate description of what we're trying to do, come to terms with this remarkable new medium which uh, has had such an enormous impact on on the public all over the world. Now, perhaps I should uh, start by thanking you for your participation in, in the te lighting test of the Senate that was, was done last, uh, several months ago, which was, an ex which was a very useful exercise in making some of the initial technical uh, uh, estimates. Let me start right with that question of lighting. Uh, if, if we should uh, go forward with television coverage of the Senate, uh, do you think there would have to be changes in the lighting system in the Senate chamber? Mr. Davis? Yes, there would be. You don't have enough light in there now to give us a uh, quality signal. I'd like to point out, uh, check with the uh, ABC lighting technician here that put the lights in this room, and we're at about 125 foot candles, I understand. When we did the lighting test in the Senate chamber in February, we had between 45 and 55 foot candles. We were operating at about half the light with that lighting test. We did get a quality picture from most parts of the Senate chamber except under the, uh, under the gallery where we had the rosette lights, and that was a problem. And as uh, I believe, as Congressman Rose pointed out to you, that uh, when you have diminishing light, uh, you don't get a sharper picture. You start getting a noisy picture if the light goes down in some areas. But you did have less light in the lighting test, which was adequate, not super, but adequate, and about half the light we're operating in now. Now, Senator Long, who was testifying this morning, I think you heard most of his testimony, uh, and you'll recall that although he opposes gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage, thinks that there are, are are occasions in which it would be appropriate to, to televise Senate proceedings. If that should be the direction that we would go, would it be necessary to permanently install lights, although we only use them intermittently, or, or is, it a, is it as satisfactory to temporarily bring in lighting for those occasions? I would prefer to have permanent lighting. Uh, speaking for NBC News, uh, my colleagues may have a different attitude. I think that uh, that is a big job. The Senate chamber is not an easy place to light, and you would have to have time to have the electricians light it. Uh, if we were using rented equipment, you'd have rental costs every time you wanted to do it. I think that a permanent lighting system would be the way I would go. Is it general agreement on that? Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. I think Chris, that, uh, Go ahead. I, I think we could do a better job yeah. if we were allowed in there and, and allowed to leave them permanently. And again, it would be less intrusive. Of course, another consideration is that you can't always predict well in advance that the event is going to, to be uh, one in which coverage is going to be desired. Uh, if, uh, just for an example, it were the trial of an impeachment, uh, you might have a month's notice plenty of time to get ready. But as the shocking events of uh, the last few days in Washington have shown us, uh, events can break very, very fast and might require uh, almost instant, instantaneous response, in which case you could be under some disadvantage. From our point of view, I think the House is a good example. The news is unpredictable. Uh, and every day something uh, unpredictable does happen in an in institution such as this. Uh, so from our point of view, obviously, we want continuous coverage. I think from an aesthetic point of view, which is very important to you in the Senate chamber, which has a great deal of historic value, 
uh, to have permanent lights installed would be much better than bringing temporary lights in. If you saw the lighting test, which was uh, something just a makeshift thing to do a test, you saw how those lights were overhanging the balcony. That would not happen under a permanent arrangement. You wouldn't even see the lights. They would not be noticeable. We've had several estimates of, as to how many cameras would be necessary. Uh, from the network's point of view, what would you think would be desirable? We think five, Mr. Chairman. You think five would do it? Yes, sir. Well, that's uh, of an opinion that will be welcomed around here, both on uh, cost terms and, uh, and in terms of general, general dislocation. What uh, your old bureau chiefs, uh, what, how do you plug into the house system now? How do you decide what to, to pick up? Uh, and, and how do you use the feed that you get? How do you share it with your individual member stations? I can speak for NBC. It may be different at CBS and uh, ABC. We generally take a continuous feed of the house system uh, provided to us by the, the house operators and technicians. And it is microwaved to our studios on Nebraska Avenue. We have a producer who monitors that feed through the day, and if there's something on there that we want to use, then we will include it in a newscast. Our correspondent in the House Gallery also monitors the floor proceeding, but we take the signal in by microwave to our studios and then decide editorially what we will use of it. The system at CBS is roughly the same, Mr. Chairman. And at ABC, but we take it in online. Uh, the Librarian of Congress was, uh, was here, and he testified, and of course he is, in addition to being Librarian of Congress, a distinguished historian himself, so he may have some bias in, in the uh, direction of developing uh, historical evidence. But he's talking about the value of an exact record of the Senate's four proceedings. Now, I presume that would require that the, ca that the cameras be focused on the participants uh, in the debates. But what more would commercial television want to do? Um, there, there really, my experience is there isn't much reaction in the Senate galleries. They don't uh, beat on the bleachers and yell, uh, kill the umpire and all that kind of thing. But uh, woke me up, Mr. <laughs> Maybe that's what I was trying to do. <laughs> I'll ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if if you were suppose you had total control over the system, we're going to just turn over this whole thing to to uh, commercial television, what would you do besides uh, pan in on the speakers? I think we would cover the story very much like a print journalist covers it, but with cameras. Uh, yes, we would try to gauge reaction and read people's reactions uh, by moving away from the speaker occasionally to see how someone is uh, reacting. I think one important well, as point you, here as you do in uh, uh, the joint sessions, for example, Absolutely. where the president or some foreign visitor comes to a joint session of the Congress, and you you have the way to see how it, it's being received. Uh, but specifically, in answer to a point that Senator Long brought up, I think you will find that that we are very respectful in our coverage of the institutions that we cover. Uh, the same way, in fact, that the print press is. We're not going to be panning the room uh, looking for empty chairs uh, as a matter of course or something. I think, you know, we understand as journalists uh, the traditions of this institution, uh, the procedures of it, and our coverage is going to reflect that. It's not going to be uh, disrespectful. You've You've generally uh, testified in favor of this proposition, but could the networks actually support coverage on a gavel-to-gavel -gavel basis? Uh, who actually would use the original feed? Uh, there's a lot that goes on in the world that 
besides politics, sometimes we, we in political life forget that, that there's a great deal going on out there besides the things in which we're engaged. And, and you don't forget it. You, you keep your eye on where the human condition is, uh, is leading us, and, that, and there are a lot of things that the public's interested in. Um, would gavel to gavel really be a practical thing from your point of view? I don't think that any network would carry gavel to gavel coverage of the United States Senate. I don't think it's newsworthy, and our interest, as Mr. Bernstein has said, is primarily as journalists what is newsworthy, but certainly when uh, newsworthy events are occurring on the floor of the Senate. We would we would take excerpts of, of that, the, both debate and the vote. Um, but in a society as diverse as ours, where there are hundreds of radio and television stations, I think the figure recently topped 10,000, uh, and cable systems, I'm sure there are some uh, who would serve their viewers and listeners best by deciding to carry uh, uh, gavel to gavel coverage, particularly a cable system that may have 40 or 50 channels uh, accessible to it. So, what you're really looking at is is over the horizon a little bit in the diversity that is that we are anticipating in this whole communications industry and the single shooting that you can do for individual audiences, right? I think that's fair to say, Senator. Uh, I think the experience that the House of Representatives has had, as, as Mr. Rose described it this morning, is something that we would uh, envision happening in the Senate as well, where we excerpt what we believe is newsworthy and a cable system carries the entire proceedings. There's a, an additional element that Mr. Fui is referring to there, and that is that, that the camera really, to some extent, is our notebook. Uh, we don't have that same ability to cover your proceedings that the man with the notebook has now. So what we obviously would do is selectively excerpt from that gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage. But I think from our point of view, uh, it's almost essential that we do have gavel-to-gavel. -gavel. I would be concerned. You could make the selection. Exactly. Yes, sir. As you yes, were sir. concerned by who would make, at least I believe you were concerned, judging by the wording of your question in the previous witness, who makes the judgment in Paris as to which As in the French is. system where they only televise ma what, right. what are by definition major events, but the definition of a major event is, uh, was the question because that uh, the whole control of the system depends on who makes that definition. I would suggest that the rule uh, should be parallel with the one you use for committees, where if it's a matter of vital national security, you have closed door sessions. We don't appreciate all of them. We think some go too far, but I think that that has been workable, where you make a case that this is a national security matter and it's a closed session, that that would be one way to determine whether we're allowed to cover it in the Senate. Otherwise, I think everything else ought to be open to coverage. I'd be very concerned if you would say you can come in today, but you can't come in tomorrow. And it may not be a matter of national security, but just some sensitive debate on an issue that some senators would not want publicized. We would like to make that as a news judgment, Senator, rather than see it made as a political judgment. Of course, uh, there's, there could be a retrospective aspect of this, too. Uh, uh, let's say I get up and make a speech on some subject on the Senate floor, which uh, you ignore, as is, has happened. But uh, I turn out to have been dramatically and uh, catastrophically wrong. So that three weeks later, after uh, events have caught up with me and make it apparent to the world that I was dramatically and catastrophically wrong, then what I said might have some uh, news value. So uh, would that be the kind of uh, that's possibility? A risk you, that's a risk you would run, I think. Uh, that Risk we run every. That's every, right. It's risk yes. I'm running right now right. here, right. engaging yeah. in this dialogue with you. That's right. That's right. Uh, but that would be a possibility. That would be included in in what you what you are talking about as your uh, uh, news judgment. Senator Ford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm leaning back, listening to uh, some judgments that are going to be very difficult to. Uh, uh, to agree with, I think, uh, 
I'm not sure that the members of the Senate are going to let you be the sole judge of what they do or do not do. And that will become a very sticky question, I suspect, at some point, not trying to make, make a judgment now as to what that decision will be, made, will be but it's obvious uh, uh, who's going to control the manpower that puts out the coverage from the Senate floor if and when. And I think it's going to, you might be able to cover a uh, filibuster before this uh, piece of legislation is ever passed. And I think we got that indication today. You, you uh, one of the panelists made a statement that you've had very good cooperation between uh, uh, the uh, committees and the coverage of committee hearings. And uh, it's been a very cooperative venture. But having been here only a short period of time, I've always noticed that when a secretary came and testified, the lights were all on, and as soon as they left, everything was dismantled and what carried out over the other witnesses that were there. The, um, uh, maybe a Ralph Nader would come and testify, and we'd have a lot of cameras. And uh, then when he was off, then the cameras would go and everybody would leave the room while we were trying to listen to the other witnesses. I make that a point. And the point I'm trying to make is that the private citizen comes from Colorado or Texas or North Dakota or wherever that has a statement to make that's very important to that area never gets on. And the only time they have any kind of input is in the committee record and if somebody wants to read it. Now, I'm as concerned as Senator Warner is about committee work. I'm not sure, but what we might uh, have greater uh, impact on the uh, public, as we're trying to say we're doing here with this, if we televise committee. Of course, we've got 25, and how are you going to get them all out on 25 different channels? That poses a different, uh, uh, different problem. And uh, so I'm, I've got some, that's, I think if we're going to do it, you have to do it from one end to the other. Now let me ask you this. You say you're going to pool, or your, your proposal would be to pool it, and then it would spin off to the three networks, or what about CNN? Would they have the ability to pick it up, or public broadcasting? They'd pick it up just like you would with your outfit. Then uh, uh, who should control, then uh, uh, which one of you control? How do you, how do you control a pool, you know? Uh, is it just there if anybody wants a piece of it? Uh, you going to sell it? Uh, or do they have an opportunity to, to use it on, uh, if, if a cable uh, has an uh, extra channel? If they win their court case, uh, they'll have, be able to put on uh, 83 channels, I guess, if they can get that many uh, pieces. So they could very easily carry uh, the proceedings of the Senate chamber or the House chamber both at the same time if they were going on, full from gavel to gavel then those who are not in the newspaper every day in the Senate and some who are less advertised, uh, they would have an opportunity to make their speeches and the public could hear it. They might learn that the fellow's name who is not in the paper every day, that the fellow's making the other speech, might have some common sense about him. Uh, something about how do you control it? Now, who's going to be responsible? I'll get back to that. Senator, we have a, a pool of, uh, that we form uh, whenever uh, we are forced to by reasons of space, as we are today, or for reasons of uh, necessity, as when, for example, the President speaks from the Oval Office. We have a great deal of experience in forming pools. We have an agreement by which anyone can join a pool. There is no exclusion from a pool. Uh, we have contracts with, uh, for example, you mentioned CNN and with public television and with anyone else who wants to join in. So we're not without experience in this regard. We, we, the purpose of a pool is to make, uh, the, make the event available to the public in the best possible way. We prefer to compete. We compete every day very hard. But when we're forced into a pool, as we were today, it, it uh, goes on in a civilized manner along lines that have been drawn for many years. If you look out in the corridor, you'll see that uh, this signal is being delivered to a number of broadcasters out there, and anyone could have come. If, for example, a, a station from your home state of Kentucky had um, expressed the desire or does in, in the next hour or two that they would like a, a tape of this, it will be provided to them. Let me ask you this. As I understand it, uh, Mr. Chairman, is ABC in control of the cameras of the pool here today? It's an NBC pool. Is it NBC in charge it today? It is ours. Is it NBC? It is ours. Sir? It's ABC. <coughs> ABC. Well, I was correct. Correct. 
Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So we'll have to have a, an instant replay, won't we? Right. Okay. Uh, but each network, including PBS, has been in the room with many cameras. You know, and you've had your pool here, yet we, when I know it's the NBC camera and you leaned back uh, to cooperate so they could get a good picture of uh, uh, the man in the middle. Uh, <laughs> you know, so that tells you something, doesn't it? Uh, and so I just wondered if the pool plus all these others, see, we've had the many cameras around. Uh, that, that was in, that was in, I mentioned the lines that have been drawn for many years. That's in conformance with our agreement. The main cameras, th those were cutaway cameras. Yes. Oh, yes, I sir. understand that, and they might make that may be the shot that they'll carry on their network tonight. It could be. Yeah. Okay. Or it could be intercut, and probably will be with the output of these other two cameras. Um, if the Senate decides to retain full control of the system, would you approve a system of fee charges for broadcast uh, privileges? in order to recover some of the Senate's costs? I think we would, with the Senate, come up with a, some sort of schedule uh, of fee charges that would, would be agreeable to all. Anybody else disagree with that? Well, I think we would try to find some way to pay our way. Uh, let me point something out uh, that we have not addressed here, and that is in the uh, current setup in the House, that is, those are House-operated cameras and the technicians are employed by the House. Uh, we have some union problems uh, that preclude us from carrying any more than three minutes of the House proceedings on Does that ABC contract. have that same provision? ABC has a similar yes, contract. Yes, same contract. CBS, CBS does not. CBS does not. But on our union contract, we can carry up to three minutes per day of the House proceeding. Uh, if you were to have a Senate system and were to go gavel to gavel, under our current contract, we could not carry gavel to gavel without some accommodation or understanding with the union or a new contract. Does that get into the problem of pooling and what you're proposing to do now on a gavel to gavel proposal? No, but I just no. point that out. But you could not on your station carry longer than a three-minute station or your network more than a a three-minute segment. That's correct, under the existing contract. Well, let me, do you have any question, either one of you, any question in your mind uh, uh, that the House system violates the First Amendment in any way? It violates the First Amendment in the sense that professional journalists are excluded from uh, operating a tool of their trade. Yes, sir. Very much so. I would agree with that. We do not have the right that we should, I think, under the First Amendment to control our own coverage. What rights, then, will the members of the House, what have they retained or what have they lost under their privileges? as it relates to the statements they make on the Senate floor or a House floor. They have lost nothing there. They can make it and it's printed and they cannot be. Uh... Well, let's get into one that I had some interest in FTC, as uh, you all know. And uh, we get a lot of regulatory problems and uh, uh, so forth. And we're gonna video all of the proceedings of the House and the Senate and regulations uh, go far beyond the intent of legislation. I mean, it's, it's legislation by regulation, and I don't like it. But nevertheless, it finally goes to court. Goes to court. The industry, regardless of what it, what it, which one it might be, and they acquire a copy of the debate on the Senate floor or the House floor, and they bring that to the court proceedings to show that the intent of the legislation was not the regulatory uh, operation on which they were, it was being imposed upon by a commission. Now, you see any objection to that? No, sir. It's something they can't do now. You mean to using our tapes of this? Or certainly, the archives or the, or the I, daily I was going to say, certainly from our point of view, uh, uh, we would wait for a subpoena in, uh, in 
that instance, I think. Well, do you see any problems with this? If you didn't have it, you couldn't, they wouldn't serve a subpoena on you. Obviously. Yeah. Uh, the, I'm, I'm on, I'm, uh, there is a legislative process here and a statutory <laughs> process that we're under, that we're operating under. And I made the statement yesterday as governor, I had to operate under regulations that were not the intent of the legislation as I knew it and as the sponsors of that legislation intended for it to be. And so when I would come to Washington to try to work out some of the state problems as it related to regulation, I've been told many times by particularly congressmen that that was not the intent of the legislation. I said, well, this is what I have to do. He said, that can't be true. And then we call in the secretary, get an assistant secretary, and he says the governor's right. But what I'm saying that the, what we, then the intent on the floor really today is not what the ultimate uh, result is of legislation. We're getting into a uh, arena in which uh, I as a debater and Senator Warner as a debater and we debate each other on the floor that we're taken into a courtroom to show under the suit as it relates to regulations our debate on the Senate floor and we become a figure in the court proceeding. Seems to me that having a videotape record of that debate is, is a, an assist to your side, Senator. Well, but it's, it, but it's a detriment to his. But if uh, we're, I'm not a lawyer, but if we're- I'm not either, drive we're on. operating under a best evidence rule and, and uh, your lawyer wants to come in with a subpoena for that- Not video. my lawyer, I'm talking about industry lawyer versus the, 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 the government lawyer as it relates to regulations being imposed on your industry, for instance. Yeah, you were interested in KidVid. Is the situation any different, Senator, than with print, where, uh, where you already do have uh, a record of the proceedings? If you've made a mistake in, in the record, you can correct that, but you don't correct the video. I, I'm just posing, there's so many problems, in and we went far beyond just the camera in the Senate chamber yesterday, far beyond. Rules changes, different procedures, changing institution. It went, we, we went far beyond just that single question. And this is as enlarged just the cameras in the, in the Senate chamber, far beyond anything I thought we would be viewing today and, and the interest that we would have as related to this one question. So it, uh, I'm just posing some things. There's a corollary problem to this very important issue raised by Senator Ford, mm -hmm. and that is, if these tapes are in existence, then that becomes evidence which should be admitted to the proceedings. But just think of the obligation on the part of the Congress to store this enormous amount of videotape for indeterminate periods of time. As a general rule, a piece of litigation regarding one of our statutes is several years after the passage of the statute. And we'll find that the record, print record, is different from the video. Well, that's a separate question, yeah. but the question is, does the Congress then have an obligation to retain vast storehouses of this video? Well, how long can it be retained, by the way, from uh, the standpoint of... Under proper conditions, I think probably indefinitely. Indefinitely. Yeah, but I think you're looking at the dark side of it. I think the benefit of having this as a video record far outweighs the storage problems. Could you quantify the storage problems? Uh, what sort of well, a, I think tape each year, how much know, would we accumulate volume-wise? Well, we're, getting, we're getting smaller tape. You can, I, I assume there's some way that you could go to half-inch tape, which is a smaller cassette mm -hmm. for storage purposes. Uh, the day may come when electronically it can all be stored in a bunch of transistors and there will be no, no tape. We, we now can store still pictures in a machine and there is no picture in the machine except uh, electrical currents, and you can may maybe do that someday with videotape. Had you finished? Forgive me for not being present. I was elsewhere uh, on business. You had a vacant. Yeah, yeah, so we showed sure. your vacant seat over here. <laughs> <laughs> the question is going to be two roll calls. Those are the, the clerk tally, and those are the picture taken of the vacant seats. I'm interested now in thoroughly exploring this area of, of less than gavel to gavel seems to me that this is probably the area in which we're going to gravitate. It minimizes a lot of the negative aspects of this proposal. As you may know, the resolution before us by Senator Baker provides as, fut, as, as such, quote, such coverage shall be provided for, con for continuously at all times, except for any time when a meeting with closed doors is ordered, end quote, from SRS 20. 
have you had the full opportunity here to provide your wisdom for the record on the pros and the cons of gavel to gavel versus a more selective system? We did discuss that, Senator, uh, briefly. We, we said that we uh, would be opposed to arbitrary exclusions. All right, let's dwell on the word arbitrary. Supposing we did it by a system not unlike what we have now, unanimous you know, consent orders or consent orders for time agreements on debates. We superimpose on ourselves as a body limitations on debate today in terms of the amount of time that a debate can take on a particular piece of legislation or a nomination. Now, if we went about that in, in, a, in a process comparable to what we follow for legislative matters, then it seems to me you reduce the arbitrariness. I'm not clear that I that well, I follow. for simplicity, there are 100 senators supposing a vote of 51 senators can determine what portion of the proceedings in the coming week will be televised and what will not be televised. The apprehension many of us have is that this, if it's gavel to gavel, there will be a demand more and more on the senator's time to be in the chamber, whether he himself deems it important from his standpoint or not. And that will detract from work in the committee, work with constituents, and all the other things that a senator has to do. And therefore, his, his overall performance for his constituents, his state, his nation will be degraded. Now, this is very seriously in the mind of a number of senators, and particularly mine. So if we go to the partial system where we select those events which will have national attention and thereby we can share with America and indeed the world the proceedings here, it seems to me a reasonable compromise. Now if we did it on a procedure similar to what we now have for purposes of limiting debate, we remove, I think, the arbitrary nature of the decision process, a well, majority let, would control when that camera is in operation and when it's not in operation. Uh, let me uh, take this another step as an analogy. Let, let's suppose there was something of vital national interest or international interest, but was terribly embarrassing, perhaps, to the majority. All right. The chances under your plan of that getting coverage in the Senate chamber are about nil or zip. Ah, you're wrong. Zip for television, but it would be accentuated for the written press. Why not? That's not fair. <laughs> you mean it's not fair in the sense that some people only rely on television for purposes no, of their think acquiring think, knowledge? No, I think it's been in the system's been in effect 205, well, 200 years. That's why we're, we're here. Yeah, that's why we're here. But when you say it's unfair, that seems to me a, a very hasty pronouncement or no, judgment. I, I think that if you're allow, allowing the writing press to cover something of national importance or international importance and you're excluding the cameras and television, it's unfair. Well, then in due course, the majority will pay a bitter penalty. They'll soon be voted out if they're going to arbitrarily superimpose their judgment on what's for the benefit of the public and what is not. Senator, I think the, some of your other colleagues. The, the policies and procedures of the Senate ought to be in the hands of, of, of senators. I, I don't think we have an interest in that. I, we, no, we but would I, like I'm to trying see, to glean from you. You're, you have a knowledge of the public right. and its need to learn and know. And I'm trying to gain from you whatever we can for the record. Should this committee look carefully at a less than gavel to gavel procedure and then eventually the Senate as a whole look at that as a possible compromise? I suppose that's why we came here advocating gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage, to relieve you of, of that kind of decision. I suggested, uh, while you're out of the room, Senator, that that would be a news judgment rather than a political judgment under a gavel-to-gavel -gavel, uh, operation. Well, you make the judgment every day what you yes, sir. or not. So that's right. maybe we can make the same judgment what you ought to have and should not have. Again, what, what we're seeking uh, is the ability uh, to do the same kind of reporting really that the print press does to have the to have the same access uh, because this is how we cover the news you know the way we cover the Senate now Senator Warner it's it reminds me so much of the way Harper's magazine covered the Civil War we hire an artist 
and we say to the artist, please draw some likenesses of the Senate chamber and the senators, and we'll put those on television. We're adapting 19th century technology to, to the 20th century. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And incidentally, in terms of correcting the record, uh, when our reporters, like print reporters, are in the gallery, uh, generally, the attempt is made to use the words used on the floor and not to go back, back to a corrected record. So, so we try to make that uh, the record well, that we Well, in terms use. of real time, it's almost impossible, and I'm you not can't, sure you have access you to the procedure. You can't be there at, at every moment, obviously, but we always do, as journalists, make that well, attempt. much of the record, as you may know, is corrected by the individual senatory staff after Afterwards. he's finished the statement in a room which is provided for the purpose of editing. Right. Would you say almost unanimously then you're opposed to any system other than gavel to gavel? I'm trying to... I think we would, certainly from ABC's point of view, uh, we have a kind of priority list. Uh, obviously, some coverage is better than none. Uh, as a matter of principle, we think that it's terribly important that, that there be gavel to gavel coverage and that the least uh, desirable solution to this, uh, save no televising or broadcasting at all, would be partial. Mm -hmm. I think we'll finish. Well, we thank, thank you. you very much for taking of your time. It's, it's been helpful advice to the thank Senate. Thank you for hearing thank you, Senator. Thank you. We have a is our last witness uh, today, Mrs. Barbara Cohen. Thank you. We've talked about television now for two hearings, and one of the reasons is that there seems to be more potential difficulties involved in televising our proceedings than we perhaps imagine. Also, the costs are greater. Uh, nevertheless, in no way do we want to neglect radio. Therefore, we look forward to your views as representative of the national public radio. Thank we you, welcome Mr. you. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, I have a written statement that I have submitted which includes some audience estimates uh, that may be of interest to the members of the committee. And uh, with your permission, I would like to abbreviate my statement today. Your statement in its entirety will be made a part of the record without objection. Uh, I, there are a few things I would like to uh, mention particularly, though, for your consideration. Uh, while the committee is considering a number of proposals by which the American people may be able to watch Senate debates on television, we would like to remind the committee about one very lively and readily available broadcast medium, radio. Radio coverage of debates on the Senate floor not only presents vastly fewer technical problems, but in fact it has already been done. Many of the members of the committee remember National Public Radio's live coverage of the 38 days of the Senate floor debate on the Panama Canal Treaties, one of the most controversial issues of 1978. NPR aired all 38 days of debate live from the Senate chamber, and the public response was overwhelming. Ten million people listened to the Senate debating the treaties in the first three days of the broadcast. Moreover, radio coverage of the debate was completely unobtrusive from the point of view of the members on the floor and the occupants of the press and visitors' galleries. Radio required no lights, no multiple camera platform positions, and no reworking of the Senate chamber whatsoever. We received a number of favorable comments from senators and staff members regarding the service afforded by our airing of the debate and neither NPR nor any of the other radio organizations who cooperated in this venture received a single complaint about our reporters and technicians' presence in the gallery overlooking the Senate floor. Briefly, the radio arrangement during the Canal Treaties debate called for three people to be stationed in the gallery, one NPR correspondent who provided the commentary on the proceedings and identified speakers, one NPR technician to supervise our facilities, and one ABC technician who provided sound of the debate on a pool basis to other radio broadcasters stationed in the offices of the Radio TV Correspondents Gallery.
Our correspondent, stationed as she was in the corner of the gallery with a direct, unobstructed view of the chamber, nevertheless went virtually unnoticed by the members on the floor and certainly never created any sort of distraction as she went about the business of broadcasting the debate. Radio, in short, is uncomplicated, unobtrusive, compact, and an extremely efficient medium for the dissemination of special events coverage. As you consider radio broadcasts from the Senate, you need not re wrestle with the sorts of issues that have come up during your consideration of television in the chamber. Radio already has a track record in the Senate, and radio has shown that it is more than up to the task of broadcasting debate on a sensitive matter without intruding into the event itself. We would therefore urge this committee, Mr. Chairman, to consider radio coverage of the Senate as separate from and not contingent upon your decision on the future possibilities of television coverage of Senate debate. Radio coverage of the Canal Treaties debate was made possible by a special resolution of this committee in 1978. Coverage of current issues on the Senate floor is an immediate possibility thanks to the flexibility and portability of the radio medium and could be uh, uh, advantage by action by your committee. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I would like to say a word about the special role that public radio plays in the United States. It was no mere coincident, coincidence that National Public Radio was the only radio network which broadcast the treaties debate live for 38 days. Commercial considerations will always preclude commercial broadcasters' interest in such time-consuming ventures. Marketplace pressures will always force commercial radio to broadcast programming designed for a mass audience. That, in fact, is one of the principal reasons for the existence of public radio, to provide programming of an experimental, groundbreaking nature in cultural affairs, music, news, and public affairs. I hope that we will be able to provide these live broadcasts from the Senate again sometime in the near future, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. We thank you very much. I'm going to defer to uh, my colleague, Senator Ford, as he's got another meeting to attend. Let me just say National Public Radio is uh, very effective. I was on for about five minutes the other morning, and uh, uh, I had messengers uh, delivering letters to me that afternoon. So they do listen to you. I want you to know that. And uh, uh, They didn't agree with my position, <laughs> but we made them listen and, and, and respond, and I was pleased to do that. And I want to compliment you on what you do. I think thank it's, you. Uh, it's just fine. Um, who will make greater use of uh, live or tape TV broadcast of Senate proceedings, the commercial networks or the public stations? Who will make the greater use? Yes. Well, speaking for public radio, I, uh, I believe that public radio will make the greater use, as, as demonstrated by the experience in the Panama Canal treaties. I, I really don't feel competent to answer the question on television. Do you have any uh, uh, estimate uh, what, uh, what under the proceed proceedings now in the House, uh, uh, who uses the House? Uh, uh, the you use much of it or any of it? We uh, have a problem with the House uh, uh, setup. We are not permitted to have a live correspondent in the gallery, and without that, we cannot, we feel that we cannot do uh, a proper journalistic job of presenting the live House debate. We uh, have asked in the past for permission to broadcast live debates and uh, have been denied that permission. So they won't let radio in the uh, House chamber, but they'll let uh, TV. Right. Uh, so as a statement was made by the networks a while ago, that's not fair, is it? No. Okay. Uh, what, how do you feel about televising or carrying uh, messages of uh, all committee hearings and markup sessions? Well, we broadcast quite a number of congressional hearings already. I would say uh, that uh, practically every, uh, every day that there is a, a committee session going on, we are broadcasting something uh, that the Congress is doing on a, a live basis. And we frequently will do both live and summarized coverage. So uh, this is something that we have a great interest in. What, uh, what kind of reception have you had from the general public? Uh was going as it relates to your broadcast of committee hearings? Uh, generally speaking, uh, if the stations carry them, we make them available to all our stations, and it's up to the stations to decide whether to carry them. And I guess the most recent experience we had was uh, during the confirmation hearings of the Cabinet. Uh, 
uh, only National Public Radio broadcast uh, every confirmation hearing. And uh, when one of our member stations uh, in Washington decided to uh, uh, drop the radio coverage, they got a lot of phone calls and they changed their minds and decided to uh, put them back on again. Uh, let me thank you for attending thank today. You. It's good to see you change the complexion of the whole uh, hearing <laughs> uh, to the, for the better. Thank and, you. And uh, my colleague here has allowed me to make some, ask the questions first so I can make uh, another uh, committee. Well, you worked hard on this issue. Uh, I begin to sweat in here. <laughs> you mentioned the commentary which accompanied the Panama Canal debates. Objective commentary in the opinion of one senator might well be unacceptable editorializing in the view of another senator. Would radio attempt to make its commentary as objective and neutral? And if so, how would you accomplish it? Yes, uh, we have a very clear set of standards that we follow that calls for uh, no editorializing. We are prohibited from editorializing. And so by commentary, we are referring to explanatory uh, analysis of what has been said on the floor. Sometimes uh, uh, in Senate debate, it gets a little complicated and hard for the average listener to follow. And that is what we have in mind. Sometimes also when there were quorum calls during the Panama Canal debate, we would uh, uh, switch to our downtown studio where we would have experts available and we always had a balance there between people who were in favor of the uh, treaty and people who were opposed. And I think the results uh, also were in the, in the senators, uh, among the senators' opinions themselves. We had uh, a very complimentary letter from uh, the late Senator James Allen who felt that uh, it was very effective for presenting his point of view and we also had uh, uh, high compliments from Senator Byrd and others who uh, were on the majority side. We talked at the hearings about restrictions which might be placed on the use of television feed and tapes. Would such restrictions, if desired by the Senate, be feasible for radio? Uh, we did not run into this problem previously. No one uh, asked us for uh, uh, copies of the tape to be used for other purposes. Um, I think that's something that I would want to consult with our legal uh, people about. What would be the relation of public radio and commercial radio in the type of radio coverage we've discussed? Well, uh, in the uh, Panama Canal hearings, there was a commercial pool available, and uh, since the commercial networks were not interested in doing the live broadcast, they were content to take excerpts from the pool. Uh, so that seemed to work out pretty well. We often are working together on joint ventures, and we're usually interested in more coverage uh, and, and more often interested in gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage than the commercial networks are. For instance, uh, during the Republican and Democratic national conventions, uh, while I believe some of the other uh, commercial networks uh, offered gavel-to-gavel uh, -gavel coverage, I believe we were uh, only our member stations were actually using it. You mentioned the suitcase for the Panama Canal. Would you have any estimate of what would be involved if we went to a complete system for radio? I think we'd need nothing more than that suitcase. Mm -hmm. That same suitcase. We thank you very much thank you. for participating in this very important hearing thank in the history of the United States Senate. We're indeed making history today, and what the outcome will be, no one is certain at this time. But I can assure you it's going to be a very lively debate on this subject, both in this committee and should it go to the floor of the United States we, Senate. We'd be very happy if you'd consider a separate rule to let us broadcast that. <laughs> thank you very much. There, um, we have a letter from Representative uh, Claude Pepper, which uh, we'd like to make a part of the record, and without objection, that will be done. There being no further witnesses uh, scheduled for today, nor anyone in the room evidencing a desire to testify, silence, we will adjourn now, subject to the call of the chair. Thank you.